morning. I want to welcome you to Palm Sunday Worship. Various churches from the area here in Southeast Michigan, Holly Presbyterian Church, St. Andrews Presbyterian Church in Davison, Kirkridge Presbyterian Church in Grand Blanc, First Presbyterian Church in Fenton, and Trinity United Presbyterian Church have come together this morning to show you and to give you an opportunity to worship together, representing the fullness of the body of Christ. We pray that you will be blessed in worship and that you will connect with God and with each other. Let us praise God together. pray. Holy God, you reveal the truth about your people and the ways of our world in the suffering of the Son and his steadfast love. Show us again the image of humility you desire for us and teach us obedience so that self-emptying may be our pathway through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Join me in the call to worship. Humble and riding on a donkey, we greet you. Acclaimed by crowds and children, we cheer you. Moving from the peace of the countryside to the corridors of power, you are giving the burst of Beden a new dignity. You are giving majesty a new face. You are giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. With them, with heart and voice, we shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Our first hymn is Hosanna, Loud Hosanna.
we sing, we wave our branches, we shout Hosanna. Then we turn away to go back to our old ways, our old lives, our old sins. But God is in the business of granting forgiveness and filling us with new life. Let us confess to the one who comes to fill us with grace. Join me in the prayer of confession. With eager hearts and open hands, we welcome Jesus until he refuses the power we offer him, choosing to become our servant. We pick up the faith we had laid on the ground before him and put it back on the shelf where it belongs. Our pride keeps us from being able to follow him all the way to Calvary. Have mercy upon us, God of holiness. As you come to us, you bring healing for our brokenness, peace for our troubled lives, hope for our doubting minds. May we empty ourselves for everything that keeps us from following you so we may receive these gifts and more from Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please join me in the responsive declaration of pardon. The Lord is our strength and might. Jesus is our salvation. In Jesus, our sins are forgiven. In Jesus, our cries are answered. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hi, it's Madeline. And during this quarantine time, I have been learning how to play the guitar. So I thought I'd play you guys a song about keeping faith during rough times. And it's called Oceans. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will
God's holy word. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week, we turn our eyes again in our hearts to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him for it with our lips, but may follow him in the way of the cross. Amen. Scripture reading this morning from the book of Psalms, number 118. This messianic psalm is about the Lord's loving kindness. Begin at verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. On to verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the vestal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. That is the word of the Lord. Who is this king that 
From the beginning of time, God wrote his story on his hands. His story of love with us. And our lives have been etched into these palms, into his hands, just like they're etched onto his heart. There is what appears to be, though, a great contradiction. Because the same people who greeted him coming in as he rode in on a donkey would turn against him, not even a couple days later. They first held signs of praise and acclamation. They raised their hands. They grabbed palm branches down from the trees. They laid their cloaks out before him. And they hailed him as the king. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet a few days later, this story of contradictions, the same hands that shouted acclamation, then became fists of rage and anger as they turned against him. They held signs of welcome and approval, and then quickly those signs of prayer became signs of rejection. But from the beginning of time, God wrote his plan upon Jesus' hands. This was part of the story, that God would enter into this messy world of craziness and contradictions. And God had a plan in the midst of this. God wanted us to live rather than just to be. The Apostle John tells us the meaning of the passion story when he says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The glory of Jesus, the very glory of God, is formed in how God entered into our own world of contradictions. The glory of God and the glory of Jesus becomes raised upon the cross. The thing that was meant to show rejection, that was meant to show that God could not claim this man as his own. To end his life upon a cross? What kind of king would that be? And yet God took that symbol of rejection and turned it and used it for his glory and his power. And that can be a really hard thing for us to grasp. We don't like to think about Jesus' death, and we certainly don't like to think about our own. Insofar as Jesus died on the cross, we might read that story and try to just glimpse through it really quickly. It's not the part of the story that we want to stay in. We want to rush straight to Easter. But rather than reflecting upon how his hands were pierced and how his side was also, we don't want to think about how he died upon that cross, grasping for every last breath. But when he cried out in agony and breathed that last breath, we just rather fast forward to Easter morning. But the story of the passion of Christ was never intended to be a pretty story. It's been told throughout the centuries not to condone violence and certainly not to glorify it. And yet we retell this story because the focus is not so much on the death, but what came after but you do have to walk the way through. And so it was for folk like you and me, the folk who waved palm branches one minute and then cried out for his crucifixion the next. One day, they greeted him with cheers, and the next day, they shook their fist and called for his death. I once heard of a man in another country who was jailed for speaking about Jesus. And his response, as the guards led him into the room, he brought a large rock and he placed it on the table. And he explains to them that if they try to silence him, even this rock will cry out. Surprisingly, the guards let him go. Amazing. Histories of the world have come and gone. Heresies have come and gone, and Jesus says, you know what, even if we, or even if the disciples were to be silent, the rocks would cry out. Imagine trying to silence this story. 
but we sometimes think that God is absent, is over all of creation, kind of sets it to go at work and then lets it go and forgets about his creation. But that's not the kind of God that we have. God is imminent, is at one with creation, and every tree and every book and every rock, every human and animal and creature, this world was created by a loving God. And even more so, the people who were put into this world, who were called to steward it, God said, I've loved this one, and this one, and this one. And so God placed his image within us and called it good. And God's love is unlimited. This love that God had for the world, it stands against all attempts of us to narrow it or make it specific or just to limit it to a certain kind of people. And even the author of the Gospels faces the temptation to say in John that God doesn't just love all of humanity. God doesn't just love his own. The disciples are spoken to by Jesus and they're commanded to love one another. But Jesus, at the end of his life, tells them to go out into the world. And even John seems a little bit tempted to restrict it to just the people who were the chosen ones. Jesus, you really just meant these ones, right? Those ones. And God did choose a people. But God chose a people in order to be the light to the world, in order to show the others what it meant to be loved by a God whose love was unlimited. And so God sent his son into the world. God so loved the world, all of his creation, all of the people. And some of us have this compartmentalized life where we just want to have a certain part and say, well, God, it's really easy to love these. Or it's really easy, God, to put you in this part of my life. And so most of us try to serve God in that area, but we're not really good at thinking about what it means to say that God so loved the world. Does it mean that God loves our political structures or our corporate structures or natural energies and vast space? Our failure to comprehend the love of God and the whole meaning of for God so loved the world means that we need to care for this world. We were made to be stewards of it. And yet God's love is unconditional. When God said, for God so loved the world, in the beginning, it's a declarative statement. It's a given. God's love is for all of creation. And so that word is spoken sometimes as if it were conditioned, where God will only love us if and when we do something, but that's not how it is. It doesn't say, if you're righteous, God will love you more. It doesn't say, if you're educated or literate, God will love you. It doesn't say anything like that. This phrase is our defense about thinking that God's love is somehow abstract, somehow just something emotional. But God is not distant from his creation. God is involved in our time, in our space, God is involved and loves the people and this matter and all that he created. And it is in this cosmos, it is with these people and this world that God is concerned about bringing to fulfillment what God began. Creation is sustained and continues in God's love. And yet, there's this hope. We somehow have messed up this world that God has given us to steward. We break our relationship with God. We break our relationship with others. We even break our world. And yet God so loved the world. And that love is God's reason for God's continued action in the world to redeem and restore creation, to repair this relationship between God and us and us and others. And so God in Jesus Christ comes and comes to redeem and it is with his relationship with us in Jesus Christ that we understand his desire to be intimate with us. For God so loved the world that he acted in Jesus Christ. Those of us who have felt that love and grace, 
Ready? I think it hit the maximum storage. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Are you almost done? Yep, last pair. Do you want to do it right here? Just sure. finish it off? I'm going to go back a little bit. Creation continues to be sustained because God loved this creation and continues to love his creation and sustain it. Because God's love is redempted, he will bring about the plan that he started from the very beginning. For God so loved the reason is the reason that God continues his love, continues to redeem and restore, and God and Jesus Christ came to redeem and restore so that we would know that God was not distant anymore, that we would know this God who started everything and whom we appear in, who appears in majesty. God gave himself in Jesus Christ with the desire to redeem us. For God so loved the world that he acted in Jesus Christ. Those of us who have felt that love and that grace are motivated then to show the same kind of compassion and love and hope for all of creation and for others because we've experienced that love and we know what it's like and we want others to experience the same thing. We're linked in Jesus Christ to the one who created us in order to share his love for the world. And in service of that, we use that love and our gifts and our talents and the things that God has given us to steward to show that love to others. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And Jesus said, I tell you, if these disciples were silent, even the stones would cry out. For God so loved the world. I love Jesus and I want to follow him, loving the world and serving him. And I want others to do that with me. Creation continues to be sustained. Because God continues, his creative act in our world, continues to redeem and to save this world that he created. And because God's love is redemptive, for God so loved the world, that love is the reason for his continued actions to redeem and restore. God and Jesus Christ came to redeem and to save and to show us what it meant that God was not some distant power that was set the world at work, but that God wanted to be intimately involved and to redeem and save us and bring us back into relationship with him. And we are linked together in Jesus Christ to God, and we share his love for creation and for others, and we bring into God's service the things that he has given us, our talents, our time, our abilities, our families, all the things that God has given us to steward. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that a whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all of the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And Jesus said, I tell you, if these disciples were silent, even the stones would shout out. For God so loved the world. I love Jesus, and I want to love him by following him into this world, serving others, and I want it to be said of me so that the rocks do not have to cry out. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, what a joy it is to celebrate Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. The disciples gathered the colt for him to ride. People shouted Hosanna, waved palm branches, and placed their cloaks in the path of the colt. Even when some were cautious, Jesus reminded them that the stones would sing out, for triumph was truly coming to the holy city, triumph in a way they couldn't imagine. So we, this day, wave our palms, physical or virtual, and sing and shout, Hosanna! We want Jesus to ride into all the places of tension and anger of our lives. We want Jesus to heal the hurts and establish his reign of peace forever. The parade is a good thing. It is not to be discounted as inconsequential to the events ahead. We need to shout with joy and let the shouts ring in our hearts. Bring us hope, gracious Lord, where we have allowed fear and confusion to reside. Bring us healing where we have been wounded or have, been, or have wounded others by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Bring us peace where we have been bombarded by bad news, anger, and alienation. Bring us with you into the holy city, not made with human hands, but in your heavenly realm. And Lord, let us not forget those who are battling the coronavirus and especially those who are on the front lines and putting themselves at risk to keep us all safe and healthy. We ask for your strength for them and for your special protection. All of this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, join in the chorus, give honor to Jesus Christ and bring your offerings of praise to him. Rejoice in the coming of our Lord, and lay your treasures at his feet.
join me on the bold for our charge and benediction. Passing from joy into sorrow and on to elation, we come to Christ this holy week. Today is only a part of the story. Jesus' triumph leads to his death, his death to his resurrection. May the journey of this week lead you into the fullness of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. <laughs>